So the, the question we now have to deal with is how do we actually get a, a 2D or 3D image out of this basically just oscillating sine wave? And the answer is very cool, slightly complicated, but it's MRI physics, so what do you expect? Uh, so first of all, just a, as an orientation, you may have encountered this in, in other classes, but there's different kinds of coordinate systems and so on we can use in MRI. If you look over on the right, you can see at the bottom here, we've got the bore of the scanner. Actually, look at the top one first. So this is looking at the scanner from the side, so you can see the bed there, the patient's lying on, their head's in there. So imagine their head's sort of where those two black Z and Y lines are crossing. Uh, so again, Z is the, the, the direction of the strong magnetic field. And when the person's head is in there, Z is basically the up-down plane through their brain, right? So from the base of the brain up through the top of the brain. And when we start looking at MRI images, this is the coordinate system we use because we've got a brain in three dimensions. So Z is up down. Uh, y is front to back, so like back of your head to your nose kind of thing is the Y plane. So when you're lying in the scanner, your nose is pointing up, right? And then X is the left to right, uh, so ear to ear side. And so that's shown over on the left here with respect to the brain. And then the other terminology that we have is sagittal, coronal, and axial where the axial plane is sliced through, like you're looking at somebody down from the top of the head. Uh, incidentally, in radiology, they typically represent uh, things like brains as if you're looking at the person from their feet rather than from the top of the head, which seems maybe a little weird, except if you imagine you're the radiologist, the person's lying in the scanner, it's their feet that are facing you. So it's sort of the literal view if you're there running the scanner, looking at the person, you're looking at them from their feet, and so you're looking at their brain from, from the bottom up. Where that's relevant is confusingly less nowadays in, in cognitive neuroscience, but still in, in like medical clinical radiology, the left side of the head is shown on the right side of the image and vice versa, because it's as if you're looking at somebody from the base, from their feet. That gets confusing sometimes. It's kind of like negative up in ERPs, um, except worse, because left and right in the brain don't necessarily inherently look different. So it's, if it's reversed, it's really hard to tell. Um, anyway, so that's the axial plane. The sagittal plane is looking kind of at somebody from the side view. And then the coronal plane is if you're looking face to face with the person. Those terms uh, come up more, more later in the course than today. Mostly today we'll be talking about X, Y, Z, but uh, to some extent I might be throwing out sagittal and coronal and axial. So the critical thing to producing a 2D or 3D image is creating a magnetic field gradient which basically means a slope. Uh, a gradient literally is a slope, right? So a, a hill, we can describe the gradient as how steep that hill is. Um, so it's a gradient, uh, but in MRI world, it's a gradient in the strength of the magnetic field. So remember, we've got, say, our, our three Tesla scanner. Somebody's in there, so the field that the person's in is three Tesla. But I mentioned right at the very beginning that you can actually create additional magnetic fields using these gradient coils, so these other bits inside the MRI scanner. And those gradient coils allow us to create a variation in the strength of the magnetic field across any spatial dimension, x, y, z, or some, some angle between those. So what's illustrated in this figure is a magnetic field gradient going from the base of the head up to the top of the head, so that's along the, the Z axis, with uh, the stronger magnetic field shown as the lighter color, the lighter shading, so white basically, and the weaker shown as the dark gray. And so person's head is in this three Tesla field, but uh, we've induced this additional gradient, meaning that what's down at their chin, the magnetic field is just slightly below three Tesla. Uh, it might be like 2.99999, and at the top of their head, it's like 3.00001, something like that. They're, they don't have to be necessarily hugely dramatic variations. Um, but we've created this gradient. And the impact that has, remember that our Larmor equation, which is repeated for you here, says that the processional speed is related to the strength of the magnetic field times some constant value. Constant value hasn't changed because it's still hydrogen, 
but the magnetic field is slightly changed across this gradient. So now the protons down at the bottom of the head are precessing a little more slowly, and the protons at the top of the head are precessing a little more quickly. And so, you know, long story short, that means that the signal we read out will be a combination of different frequencies, some faster frequencies and some slower frequencies. And the faster frequencies we know come from the top of the head because of this gradient, and the slower frequencies come from the bottom of the head. And um, we haven't, this is slightly out of sync, it's in sync with the book. Um, in class we haven't talked a lot about Fourier de decomposition, but I talked about frequency domain representations before and the idea that you can take any sine wave and break it down into component sine waves, or any, any non-sine wave, even like EEG, and break it down into component sine waves. So you can do the same thing here and say, okay, let's pull out the strength of the signal at the slower processional frequency and separate it from the, the strength of the signal at the higher processional frequency. And that'll give us the, the sort of relative signal strength across the different parts of the brain. So that's sort of, in a nutshell, how we do the spatial encoding using these magnetic field gradients to push around the processional frequency of the hydrogen atoms. Now in a little more detail with um, MR imaging, the first thing we do is slice selection. So ultimately to get a picture of the brain, you see, you know, I showed you those uh, MRI images earlier of somebody's head, those were slices, right? So you're seeing, you know, an image that has sort of, you know, it's a square, but it's one slice through the brain. So typically in an MRI scanning situation, you'll acquire a number of slices and ideally enough slices to cut through the entire brain uh, so that when you stick them together you get the whole brain. Right? So each slice is essentially a plane through the brain. It's got some thickness. In structural imaging this thickness is typically like one millimeter and so it might take a hundred or so images to get through the entire, a hundred or so slices to, to cover the entire head. So the first thing that we do in our, our spatial encoding for MRI is slice selection. And this means we turn on the slice selection gradient. You can see the slope at the bottom there. Uh, and the, the gradient sort of showing the same as in the last image, but now I've superimposed these slices on it. So we apply the gradient, which means that the protons are precessing it at different rates, right? Um, and then we send in the RF pulse, and we tune the RF pulse to the processional frequency of the slice that we want to image this time around. So each slice we're going to acquire separately in a separate scan. Um, so say we want to start by acquiring that bottom slice uh, shown here, the darkest gray bottom of the head uh, one. So that's got a lower magnetic field, so it's got a slower processional frequency. I have little lights jumping around here. And so we tune our RF pulse to the Larmor frequency of that slice, which is going to be a slower processional frequency than any other slice. So that means that when, while we've got the slice selection gradient turned on, if we send in the RF pulse at a particular frequency, it's not going to excite the protons in any of the other slices. It's only going to send in energy and excite the protons in that slice that we want. So already we know that the signal we're reading out came from that slice and not from anywhere else in the brain. And right here, this is why MRI, structural or functional, has such precise spatial resolution, and we don't have any of these questions that we have with MEG or EEG around source localization and so on, is we're not sort of trying to infer localization from outside things. We're doing some very specific physical tricks that excite protons in a specific location of space and then read out from, from based on that frequency. So, so there's no ambiguity around localization. There can be. Um, just because of artifacts and errors, but there's no fundamental um, problem. The, the only problem is if something happens that changes the strength of that magnetic field um, across the head, uh, then you can get some mislocalizations. We'll come to that later. Okay, so we turn on our slice selection gradient, then we send in the RF pulse tuned to the Larmor frequency of whichever slice we actually want to image this time around, then we turn those off. So we've done our excitation, slice selection gradient isn't needed anymore, now if we look at this pulse sequence, so I showed you the simple one before that just had the RF pulse and then the, the readout, the echo, which is at the bottom here. Now we're inducing or introducing a few things in the middle. Uh, the slice selection is the green one here, so that you can see that happens at the same time as the RF pulse. You can see it also, so it's sort of on, it's got this plateau, and then it's got this sort of negative flip uh, a little later there. 
Uh, and what that does is basically sort of undoes the effects of the slice selection gradient. So with this gradient, you turn it on. Even after you turn it off, there's a bit of residual change that's occurred because you sped some protons up, you slowed some down. So even after you turn it off, that effect is still going to be there, and they'll slowly recover. So the effect of the effect of that inverted slice selection gradient is basically to turn that off, and basically, you know, the ones that got sped up, we slow them back down to where they should be. The ones that sped up, slow down, we speed up. Right? So you just sort of turn off, not only turn it off, but reverse the effects and cancel them out. The next two things which we're about to talk about are the phase encoding gradients and the frequency encoding gradients, uh, and then you get the readout. The other bits of terminology I'll introduce you to here, well, TE or the echo time I already talked about, right? So that's the time from the RF pulse to when we read out. And we set that based on what we know about our, our T1 or T2 uh, curves and how to maximize the contrast. So we're picking the TE to maximize the contrast in our image. And then the other parameter is the TR, which you can see down at the bottom here, which is the repetition time. And so that's basically the timing from one RF pulse to the start of the next RF pulse. Um, in our further discussion today of structural imaging, the TR isn't super, super important. Uh, in functional MRI, TR is effectively how long it takes you to scan the brain once. So you're sort of each time point is one TR. Um, but that's sort of fMRI is a special case that way. In most structural imaging cases, you've got many TRs just to get through um, one slice, and then even more TRs to get through all the slices uh, of the brain. Uh, so, okay, so we did the slice selection. Now we have to figure out that's selected our slice. Now within our slice, we've got, um, say, in, in a typical structural MRI, you might have 128 by 128 individual pixels in the image. So we've got to figure out how to get the additional two dimensions within our image. How do we spatially encode those? And the way we do that is tricks involving two-dimensional Fourier transforms. So remember the Fourier transform is how we go from the time domain, so think back to EEG. The time domain is your sort of squiggly EEG signal. Fourier transform gives us the frequency domain representation of that telling us that, oh, there's a big peak at 60 hertz because that's the electrical line noise, and maybe there's a peak at 12 hertz because that's they've got lots of alpha rhythm going on in the brain, something like that. Okay, so the Fourier transform is the way to go from time domain to frequency domain. You can actually do a 2D Fourier transform where now you've got, in, in this case, it's basically dealing with images. You've got X and Y dimensions. And so here what you're seeing are sine waves, but now they're 2D sine waves. And so up until now we've drawn sine waves, you know, imagine we're effectively looking at that sine wave from, from the side, and here we're looking at it from the top. And so in this one that I drew on the board, the peaks are the white, and then the troughs are the black in what you're seeing there. Right? So those are just sort of ripples. Um, and it's two-dimensional, so that means that we can actually have these, they, they have a spatial frequency, which is, you know, if we define the square as sort of our unit, this has a frequency of two hertz, right? So it's got two peaks and two troughs. Um, this one also has two hertz, but the phase is shifted, so where the peak is is just different, right? So where the white bar is compared to the black. Uh, bottom left is similar, but now it's a higher spatial frequency, so there's more ripples or more peaks and troughs in the same amount of space. And then this is what you get with two dimensions, is that you not only have a frequency, but you have an orientation of these lines. So here the lines are sort of vertical, bottom middle, they're horizontal. It's actually the same spatial frequency. Um, I think I've got that right, yeah. Um, but a different orientation. And then you can also have these angles, so it doesn't have to be vertical or horizontal, it can be any angle in between, basically. Uh, so that's the, the sort of, in, in one dimension we talk about time domain, frequency domain. This is the, the sort of spatial equivalent of the time domain, so it's a spatial domain, basically representation. But the Fourier transform, I'll get you in just a sec, um, 
you wore an appropriate shirt for today, by the way. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the Fourier transform takes us again into the frequency domain. So we'll talk about that in the next slide. But yeah. So if you were to draw the sine wave like you did on the board, yep. the middle one, it would like, look like this, like the vertical, like that? Yeah, effectively. So it would be. Is that yeah. what you mean? Yeah. 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 I just couldn't picture it. Yeah, yeah. These things are a little tricky. You should do some 3D renderings where you could actually like take that and rotate it. So, yeah. And what Monique? was it? For the diagonal, so it's, I mean, the spatial frequency is a little higher than for the two on the left, right? Um, but it's still, you know, it's a spatial frequency, we'll say four. So it's four, four peaks there. Um, now, in reality, you would measure spatial frequency in like per centimeter or something like that. We're just saying, we're defining the square as the unit, right? But the, the same principle is the spatial frequency is how many peaks or troughs do you have per yeah. unit space? Right, and then there's a second parameter that determines the angle, right? So that's the thing is where, when you only have one dimension, your, your Fourier representation is just a number that's like the strength or the power at each frequency. Here we need a bit more data in order to tell it what the orientation is as well as the spatial frequency and, and the phase, but phase is also relevant there. Um, so the Fourier transform of a 2D sine wave gradient or any 2D picture basically is called k-space. And so this is the frequency domain representation or the power spectrum of uh, any image. Um, in this case I think it's one of those 2D sine wave gradients. And the way this is plotted is 0, 0 is here in the center. And then it's just a, a typical Cartesian coordinate system. So the y-axis is the up-down axis. The x-axis is left to right. Positive x to the right, negative x to the left. Positive y to the right, negative y to the bottom. And so we can basically look at this and say, OK, um, if we want to know the amount of power, how much sine wave is present at a particular spatial frequency, we just plot you know, sort of use our finger or whatever to, to find that spatial frequency. So if it's a strictly horizontal sine wave, um, so going back, so say the one top left there would be zero along the y-axis and some number, like, so say it was spatial frequency of two, it would be two along the x-axis. Whereas if we take that same two, two hertz, whatever, two wave uh, sine wave gradient and rotate at 90 degrees, now it's zero on the x-axis and two on the y-axis, right? Uh, and then if it was one of the angled ones, it's going to be plus something on x plus something. So it's going to be out here in sort of the top right quadrant. So this, I lied, this isn't actually the representation of one of those sine waves because one of those sine waves is actually fairly simple and it would just be sort of a point in there. Um, but this basically sort of illustrates what I just said is you can pick any point on that axis, or those two axes, and it represents a particular sine wave with 2D sine wave with a particular orientation and spatial frequency. With me so far? Right. Not Nathan, even you're... remotely. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I understood when that one came. And yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> All right. All right. So here, uh, I'm just picking this one with the vertical bars. So we've got. Um, do that so I'm not standing in front of it. So we've got a spatial frequency of two, right? It's a little hard to do two-handed, mm -hmm. right? So two white, two dark. Uh, and that's a spatial frequency along x, right? So it's varying along x, but it's not varying along y. So anywhere along y, up and down in this image, it's the same value all the way up, right? Uh, and so this corresponds to a point, so this is two units out, positive on x, right? So that's saying it's, it's a spatial frequency of two, on the horizontal dimension and a spatial frequency of zero or infinity or whatever on the y dimension because there's no variance in y. So it's right along zero on the y axis, but two there. Um, if you look at the corresponding one on the left, it's actually the same spatial frequency, but remember the phase is off, uh, exactly off. So at the far left is a black bar instead of a white bar. And so we represent that as negative on the x-axis. So again, there's no variation in y, 
but you've got, so it's the same spatial frequency, but negative two basically is the same black bar first, positive two is the same white bar first. Um, and so this one, sort of top middle, same spatial frequency of two, so now we're two up on y, but zero on x, because again, there's no variation on x. And then the ones that are out sort of off one of these yellow lines are the ones where you've got some variation in, in x and also some variation in y. So that gives you some angle. Um, so the ones that are at a perfect 45 degree angle are going to be on kind of a 45 degree line out through k space. Whereas ones like this top right one is, is closer to vertical, so it's going to be higher on y, shorter on x. So this still doesn't tell us how we get. 2D MRI images. It's just sort of orienting you to this relationship between K-space and normal space, physical space, um, because K-space is ultimately how we represent these things. All right. So the interesting thing about K-space is although it looks bizarre and abstract, any 2D image can be represented um, in K-space. And the way we do that is by Fourier decomposition. So just like any complicated EEG waveform can be broken down into component sine waves, any 2D image can be broken down into component 2D sine waves. Um, it's going to be a lot, a lot of different sine waves, so a lot of different spatial frequencies and a lot of different orientations in order to accurately represent that, but ultimately you can do it. And so if you just look at the top row for now, uh, I chose a picture of Joseph Fourier, after whom who invented the Fourier transform. Um, here, and that's the K-space representation of him, his image obtained through this Fourier decomposition. Similarly, here's a, a brain image, and there's what its K-space representation looks like. And to start to understand how this works, it's helpful to look at these other rows. So here, what we've done is we've selected only the center of K-space. And remember, the center of K-space is the low spatial frequency, so the things that change very slowly over the course of the image. So in this case, we, we don't, like the image of Fourier looks very fuzzy because we're just taking the low spatial frequency, which are the slowly changing things. All the fine grained detail in that image is the high spatial frequencies, right? So like the edges of the image and the crisp lines, those are all things that change from black to white over a very short amount of space. And so we lose that if we're only taking the low spatial frequencies. And what we get is that, you know, overall you can imagine that, like, just look at the top of the image of its head, sort of, you can imagine a white bar and then a dark bar and then a white bar. So that's sort of the lowest spatial frequency. And then it's sort of light bar, but then there's a bit of his hair is darker, then his face is lighter, then his hair is darker again than the white. So there's another sort of slightly higher spatial frequency there and so on. And that's just going vertically versus variance in brightness going horizontally and at angles and so on. And so the whole idea of the Fourier transform is like take and throw at it all these different sine wave gradients of different spatial frequencies and different orientations and see how, how they sort of resonate or fit with that image. So how much of a fit is there? Um, and represent that as, as like one dot in there in terms of its brightness. So the center of K-space represents those low spatial frequencies, which is sort of the contrast and the, the, the coarse details. And then the outside of uh, K-space represents the high spatial frequencies or the edges. And so what you end up with when you reconstruct the image only from the high spatial frequencies or the outside of K-space is this kind of weird looking image here. And this was actually an etching. And so like his coat shows up really well because his coat was actually represented in that etching as a bunch of really fine lines as opposed to like a continuous shading. Uh, and you can see kind of the fine grained details of his, the edges of his coat and his eyes and, and bits of his hair and so on, all where there were really sharp lines representing the detail there. Yeah. So I think I understand. I just want to be sure. Like yeah. by center and periphery, you're referring to like kind of like the graph. So like, mm -hmm. okay. okay. Exactly. Right. So whoop, there. Right, so the center of K-space is zero, zero. Yeah, so then it's just like the quality of the image is based on like, it's like it'll be closer. To yeah, so the, things. I mean, the quality is kind of everything together, right? Well, yeah, because, well, yeah, but, but I mean, like, yeah, like, the fine-grained yeah. detail is all the periphery of K-space, because that's where the higher spatial frequencies are. Yeah. It is, it's, it's a bit of a trip to get your head around this stuff, but once you get it, it does start to make sense by definition, I guess. 
Okay, so um, so that's basically what MRI imaging is doing, is trying to, uh, I'd like to say, paint these spatial frequency gradients on the person's head and get back out of it how strongly each spatial frequency gradient is represented. So again, this 2D Fourier transform process. Uh, and the way that we paint those spatial frequencies on the brain or on any part of the body is using uh, what we call a phase roll. So remember the phase, remember these protons are precessing and their phase is just at any given point of time where, where the arrow is pointing in that precessional circle. And when we send in the RF energy, we basically phase lock all of those protons to precess in phase with each other. So their, their arrows are all at the same point. So what we're doing to induce a phase roll is applying a magnetic field gradient that changes the precessional frequency, right? So remember that the strength of the magnetic field affects how rapidly these things are precessing. So as you strengthen the magnetic field, they'll precess a little faster. By precessing faster, that means they go out of phase with their neighbors that are in, at a different point along that gradient. Right? So, um, yeah, if you imagine down here, the, the x-axis is the x-dimension of the image slice. And what I'm showing, let's look at the top row for starters, you can see those individual arrows represent the phase of the protons at a given point in time. And so if we apply a magnetic field gradient across there, the phase is going to be different because, you know, if you if, imagine you're driving the same speed as somebody else, if you speed up, they get left behind. And so that's sort of the phase, you become out of phase with each other. So over that spatial gradient, these protons are going to become out of phase with each other. And because they can only sort of go in 360 degrees, you get this roll because, um, at some point, the phase sort of, you know, they're going so fast that they're like lapping some of the slower moving protons. So you, over the course of space, whatever dimension you've applied this gradient on, you're going to get these different phases and they're sort of going to slowly rotate, as you see there, loop around. Um, and then as you maintain this, as long as you've got that gradient turned on, the gradient can be a fixed strength, but that means that guys at one end are going faster, the ones at the other end are going slower. So over time, they're going to become more and more out of phase with each other, right? So if I'm traveling at 10 kilometers an hour and, you know, say we're running, um, I'm going at 10 kilometers an hour, you're going at 12 kilometers an hour because you're super fit. Um, over the course of an hour, obviously, you'll go 12, 2 kilometers farther than me. But over the course of two hours, you're going to go 4 kilometers farther, than me, right? So that change in speed is going to accumulate and sort of become magnify your differences over time. And so the longer you have this gradient on, the higher the spatial frequency you're going to induce along that dimension, because these things are going to start out with a, a bit of a phase roll, be sort of slightly out of phase, so that's a slow spatial frequency, low variation over whatever dimension. So say we're inducing this magnetic field gradient in the Y dimension, so that's front of my head to the back of my head. Let's say X, because that's easier for me to point to without turning my head. Um, so that means that I'm going to have sort of a slow spatial frequency in terms of the, the phase of these protons precessing. The longer I hold that on, that's going to become a higher spatial frequency. And so just by turning on a magnetic field gradient and precisely timing how long it's on for, you can paint, quote unquote, a, a spatial frequency gradient over the head along that dimension. Uh, and so you can do that along one dimension and then along the other dimension. And by the combination of them, get either the horizontal grading or the vertical grading or some sort of angled grading. And that's basically what MRI is doing. So that was in 1D. Now here you have a 2D phase roll. So imagine the square is your slice of your image. Uh, if you kind of squint, you can see that there's an angled phase roll across that. Um, whereas before I was drawing that with sort of dark and light lines, now I'm using the angle of the arrow to represent. Uh, so basically in this, like a, an arrow pointing up would be white, an arrow pointing down would be black, and everything else in between is some shade of gray. Right, so if we apply a phase roll from sort of ear to ear, and then another phase roll from my nose to the back of the head um, together, that's going to give you this angled phase roll within the slice uh, of the image that we're acquiring. 
And so just like I showed you the relationship between k-space and those sine wave gradients before, and this is too detailed to represent on the screen very well, um, but hopefully if you squint you can see that there's different kinds of angles and phase rolls uh, here. And again, those just correspond to different locations in k-space. So again, more simply, you're turning on these gradients, you're causing the phase roll by speeding up some protons at one end of the gradient, slowing them down at the other end of the gradient, and that creates some spatial variation in what's generating the magnetic field signal, right? Because these protons precessing is what's drawing our, our signal. Um, so when we read out, remember we're still reading out from one coil that just gets a complex sine wave coming out of it. But now that sine wave is going to have frequencies based on these gradients that we applied to the image. Um, so coming back, and, and this is the sort of thing that you sort of have to read it, hear it, read it again, it starts to make sense. So bear with me. Um, but if we look at this pulse sequence, so we started off with the RF pulse, and we turn on the slice selection gradient at that point. So that just excites one slice, ignores everything else. So now that one slice has RF energy. Then we turn on the phase encoding gradient. And so this is just a gradient. You can sort of ignore where it says phase and frequency encoding. Those terms are, are a bit confusing. But just the phase encoding gradient is the gradient along one of the the directions inside your slice. So we'll say phase encoding is Y, so that's from front to back of my head. So now I'm inducing this phase roll from the front to back of my head, right? So that's like a 2D sine wave gradient, black and white lines rippling across there. And the longer I have that phase encoding gradient on, the higher the spatial frequency I'm going to be doing. Uh, and then I turn on a frequency encoding gradient which just does, say, the x dimension, so left to right, so I, I can now paint a sine wave gradient of some frequency, spatial frequency across there, and so that'll determine, um, and, and I guess the critical thing to say is that, you know, you see one RF pulse, another RF pulse, so we're going to do lots and lots of RF excitations with different amounts of phase encoding and frequency encoding, so each pulse is just going to give us sort of one set of sine wave gradients, and then the next pulse, we're going to change those gradients a bit. So we've got a different phase roll, and we're going to get a different spatial gradient. And so you have to do this lots and lots of times to paint all the different possible sine waves on to, uh, and sort of add them up to get the image. So each, each echo that we get out, each readout that we get, is just sort of one snapshot of the image. And we know what the spatial frequencies were of that. And then we can combine them all together and get this k-space representation which we can turn back into to regular space. Um, so this is just showing, OK, so here's our k-space again. Y is the vertical dimension. And this is what our phase encoding gradient is, is determining, is where we are along Y. And so, like I said, you do one RF excitation, turn on that phase encoding gradient with a particular strength, and that determines whether it's a high spatial frequency or a lower spatial frequency that we're acquiring on this particular pass through, this particular echo. So the large phase encoding gradient is going to be one that induces a high frequency phase roll because it's a strong difference across in magnetic strength from one end of the brain to the other. And so that's a high spatial gradient. And then we turn on the frequency encoding gradient and read out the signal as it's on. The additional bit of, of trickery here that saves time is you don't, although we're stepping the phase encoding gradient, right, so each excitation would choose one level of that and you get one spatial frequency. Along the second dimension, so the frequency encoding dimension, we're actually reading out the echo for the whole duration that that's on. And remember that the longer it's on, the higher the spatial frequency gets. And so you're actually reading out, as you're reading out, that phase roll is changing and you're getting multiple samples with different spatial frequencies over the time that you're reading the signal out. And so that's why this frequency encoding gradient shows as being negative first, and then it goes up, and there's this long sort of positive plateau, is that, because remember, zero is in the center. So if we just turn it on, we'd actually only read out k space in the positive dimension. So you turn it on, you imagine the gradient is sort of sloped this way, you turn it on and you've got a phase roll at sort of a high spatial frequency there, then you turn it the other way and so you basically sort of, when it starts one way it starts it there, 
does all sort of the negative values along x there. Hit zero, and then the gradient flips the other direction, and then you start reading out the other values. So it saves you time that way. Um, that's really the end of the lecture. As I say, I know it's complicated. Um, you know, like people won Nobel Prizes for this, so it wasn't like the, the most obvious thing in the world to figure out the first time around. Uh, and it hasn't gotten that much easier <laughs> over the last 30 years or whatever. Um, but, but that's basically it. And, and I think the, you know, the real take-home messages are to start and understand that, okay, we're sending in RF energy. What does that RF energy do? Let's do a quick review, see who can remember. Right, so the RF energy basically causes the excitation, and that causes the precession to align, so phase lock, and also for that net magnetization vector to flip right, away from the strong magnetic field. Right, so that's the excitation, so that's the RF pulse. The slice selection is what? Right, right. So it excites it by doing what? Pulse. But what's the critical part that excites that slice and not any other slice? R frequency. R more frequency gradient. I heard right. So yes, the three of you together got the answer right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you induce that gradient. That means that the R more frequency is different across that dimension. Right. So now there's precessing faster up here, slower down here. And then we know that we zoom in by excite that slice by sending RF energy in a specific frequency along that gradient of the slice we want. Okay, so that's our slice selection. Um, it's the phase and frequency encoding that's a little trickier. Uh, and the key, I think, conceptual piece there is to go back and think about these sine wave gradients, right? And realizing that any image, whether it's a portrait of Fourier or a brain, is essentially got some variance in its spatial frequency. And we can represent that in some sort of k-space image that's basically the brightness of each point in that k-space image corresponds to how strongly represented some sine wave gradient is given you know, a particular spatial frequency in a, a particular orientation. And so what we want to do, what we're recording out are sine waves, and by putting in magnetic gradients of known strength and, and known timing, we can essentially paint those different gradients on the brain and get sort of an echo back of um, how strongly represented that gradient is and combine those together to go from the k-space representation back to the original. Yeah, is that done through programming? It's like if you sit at biotic and you watch them run an MRI, it comes up as a brain. It doesn't come up as Yeah, that's all space. under the hood. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So um, the pulse sequence programming and, and the raw image, the raw image coming off is still an oscillating sine wave. And then on the MRI co console in real time, it's doing the reconstruction and basically doing that inverse Fourier transform. So what it sees is this, and then it does the math That's to show really you that. That's confused me when I was reading. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that's all going on under the hood in the MRI console. Um, so it's only if you're using like a, a non-clinical like research grade scanner that you might actually ever see the case base data. Or, or even with the clinical ones, there are probably ways of obtaining the data in that way if you want to deal with it. But in general, the systems are set up just to do all that math for you. Right? Um, but what you do see when you're, when you're actually interacting with the scanner, so you have to you know, the pulse sequence is sort of set up, so there's a pulse sequence for a T1-weighted structural image. Mm -hmm. But you do have to give it parameters like um, how many pixels do I want in the image, left to right and right and up to down. And that, that so you're specifying that in like, you know, I want 128 pixels or I want 256 pixels. What it does with that is figures out how steep a magnetic field gradient it has to induce in order to get 256 distinct Larmor frequencies along that dimension, right? And then when you ultimately see that image as having 256 individual points along that line, that's reconstructed from lots and lots of different sine wave okay. weightings, right? 
um, as well, you have to set the phase encoding and the frequency encoding directions. And so that's determining, you know, pulse sequence, basically which dimension, left, right, up, down, front, back, um, that step is going on, and which dimension the frequency encoding is going on. Um, you also set, like, where your slices are and that sort of thing. So everything is on the user interface is done in very intuitive sense terms, but then under the hood, it's interpreting that and turning it into the math so, that does this stuff. Yeah. Okay. So that's what the MRI technicians do. Yeah. And I mean, they basically know which the boxes. Investigator. It's mostly which like the physicists there? who write the pulse sequences, okay. who understand all the math and do all that stuff. The technician is really, I mean, the technicians are trained to understand all of this stuff, but yeah. they don't have to write the pulse sequences. Okay. They just have to, you know, understand how that user interface works and what, you know, what phase encoding means. And, and there are things like, you know, in principle on your interface, you can say, oh, I want, you know, this combination of parameters. And that might end up giving you a completely terrible image if you don't understand the physics well enough yeah. to understand why or how these things are interacting. Um, like an effect that you get sometimes is, is ghosting, where like a person's nose appears in the, the middle of the, the image or something like that. And that can be corrected through an appropriate change in the pulse sequence parameters, but only if you understand the physics well enough to do it. Yeah. But by and large, again, like if you have a research grade scanner or even the ones they have at Biotic, I think they have a research agreement, so they could write the pulse sequences or modify the pulse sequences. And that's a whole area of you know, MRI physicists spend their lives developing new pulse sequences and testing them and so on. Um, but yeah, that's a very you know, specialized area of, of physics even to yeah. understand the math well enough to actually implement it. Yeah. It's not something we expect from <laughs> graduate students who want to do fMRI studies. Um, and so that's the, you know, on the good side, to the extent that you don't understand this, it probably won't impact your ability to do fMRI research or read fMRI papers. At the same time, it is, I think, very helpful to understand at the end of the day where these signals are coming from. And as, especially as we start talking about fMRI and some of the limitations and kinds of artifacts you get in it, those are coming from the physics that we've talked about today. So it really helps to understand that there, even if it makes your head 